It's a great pleasure to be able to speak to everybody um, this afternoon. Um, and so I'll just um, tell you a little bit about my work. So I'm actually one of the physicians at the John Radcliffe Hospital. I'm not a neurologist. And I spend about half of my time on the acute wards at the John Radcliffe looking after people with medical problems. And I spend the rest of the time doing research, um, principally around patients who have uh, strokes and mini-strokes, and also trying to look at the impact of my patients on the wards who have got acute illness and who I see uh, suffer with problems with thinking and memory as well as their acute medical problem. So I'm just going to start off with, with a, a bit of scene setting, really, and some of you might be aware of this report. It was um, highlighted in the media when it came out from the Royal College of Physicians about how medicine has changed, really, over the last two or three decades. So when I was a house officer, when I was first qualified, which was way back in 1992, most of the patients I looked after were, by standards of today, relatively young. So they were middle-aged or younger elderly people, say somebody in their late 60s, and most of them had single problems. So <coughs> typically one might admit uh, a middle-aged man with a heart attack, for instance, and that would be his only issue. Whereas now, when I'm on my uh, duty on the wards at the John Radcliffe, the majority of my patients are very elderly. I think the mean age of people who actually stay in hospital for any length of time is around 85. And most of those patients have got multiple problems. And this report highlighted that, and that in addition to multiple physical problems, many of our patients have problems with thinking and memory. Some of them have dementia that's already been known about in the community, but many of them come into us in the ward without any such diagnosis, and yet they are clearly confused when we look after them. And this has got huge implications for the way we, we run services, the way we train our staff, the type of buildings and the type of services we offer. And this report makes it clear that there's been a failure of the services in general to appreciate the change in medicine and to adapt our processes of care accordingly. So um, I'm going to start off by just a, a little overview about thinking and memory. And you'll all be familiar, probably again from the media, of the conventional um, pattern of thinking and memory change over time that's highlighted really by um, reports in the media of patients with dementia. Sorry, my point is not working. But if you look on the left-hand side there, you'll see there's a diagram of showing how somebody who typically um, will be uh, somebody who has normal level of thinking and memory during their adult life, and then over a course of, of really several years, often many years, there's a gradual decline in their thinking and memory such that they ultimately are no longer able to look after themselves, and we typify this with the word dementia. However, the pattern is actually much more complicated than that. And on the right-hand side, you'll see a schema of some other um, time changes in thinking and memory that may occur over actually much shorter time periods, so sometimes even days or hours. Um, and at the top there is a lady I admitted recently who had a, a fractured hip, and she'd previously been entirely fit and well and independent, was driving, walking her dog, and her hip fracture was followed by very complex surgery and infection, multiple medical problems, and this was accompanied by a dramatic and steep decline in her thinking and memory, which unfortunately didn't really recover, and ultimately she died with both functional and cognitive impairment. The second trace is of a, a gentleman who had a stroke and came to our research study. Again, he had had normal function in terms of thinking and memory. There was a step down very dramatically at the time of the stroke, which then stabilised until he had another stroke event and a further decline in thinking and memory, and he, this resulted in a dementia. Now, the bottom trace is actually the most common scenario of patients that we would see in the acute medical ward or even the surgical ward, actually, um, of somebody who's come in with an acute problem, in this case an infection, and this is associated with a decline in their thinking and memory, and it fluctuates. It fluctuates rapidly over time, over hours, and it may then get better as the patient gets physically better until they have another medical problem, often another infection, and again there's another period of confusion and worsening in thinking and memory. And you can see that from the point of view of the patient and the carers, the family members, and also for the staff who are looking after these patients, it's actually very difficult to look after somebody whose thinking and memory is affected in the context of an acute illness and in whom we just can't predict what's going to happen over the short term or even in the medium or longer term. <coughs> 
So, as part of acute illness, I'm going to talk a little bit about stroke. So, um, I've shown the picture of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher there, just to remind everybody that the two most common forms of dementia in older people are Alzheimer's disease and also vascular dementia, the dementia that is associated with stroke and other types of stroke damage in the brain. And <clears throat> well, the conventional picture of a, a gradual decline over time is typified by the Alzheimer's disease. Patients with stroke, as I showed you in the previous slide, can have dramatic changes in their function very quickly over time. And in fact, probably most older people who die with dementia have a combination of different pathologies. So some of it's stroke type pathology and some of it's pathology that's more of the Alzheimer type. Or maybe some of the rarer types that Dr. Michelle here will probably tell you about. Um, and when we look at um, patients who have dementia um, on the background of stroke, we know that a fifth of patients who have a stroke will have dementia within the first year. And I think this is something that is not appreciated widely by the general population or indeed by the politicians. Quite what a close link there is between stroke and dementia. And some of it's because the, the stroke causes um, some damage to the brain, it interrupts circuits to the brain, but it's probably also the case that there is some shared susceptibility to both stroke and dementia. So it's something about the brain itself that's making people vulnerable to both those types of pathology. And some of the work we've done in our um, group has been to look at what the risk factors are that make you more likely to develop dementia after a stroke. And we know that that's more likely if you're older, if you have more severe events, if you have multiple events, and also if you're frail and previously dependent. So if, if you've got a reduced cognitive reserve, and you remember the talk from Claire Sexton at the beginning, there's increasing evidence that people who are physically and mentally active have greater cognitive reserve and are more able to withstand something like a stroke and remain cognitively healthy. However, we know that stroke can also present with, with an acute confusional state, which we call delirium. Very, very common for us to see this on our medical wards in terms of the syndrome of delirium. But it's actually relatively rare to have it in stroke without the associated weakness or speech difficulty. But sometimes this might ha can happen, and it can cause us diagnostic difficulty. So this was a 96-year-old lady who came in on my take um, with very confused, much more confused than usual. Now, that's a pretty typical presentation on my take. The patient's not very able to give you a history, and you have to go to the family to try and get more information. But we really drew a blank with this lady. We couldn't see why she'd become more confused. She didn't seem to have an infection. She hadn't had a fall. Um, so we ended up doing a CT brain scan. This is not a very good projection, but you can see on the left hand of the image as it appears to you, there's an area of darker... Uh, shadowing in the brain there and this lady had actually had a stroke um, and this had precipitated this acute confusional state um, and she ultimately made quite a significant recovery but didn't regain her former level of function. Now stroke and dementia are diseases largely of older people, not exclusively so, but they generally affect older people in the population. So this, the implications um, for this are from the ageing population. So, again, as we heard from Claire uh, Sexton earlier, we know that we're going to get a lot more older people looking ahead into the coming decades, and therefore we are going to probably see more stroke and more dementia. Some caveats to that, which I'll come on to later. So I've talked about acute stroke and the impact on thinking and memory, both in the short term with delirium and in the long term with dementia. So what about non-stroke type problems, so acute other types of illness, what we see in the general hospital all the time? Um, we did some uh, research recently supported by the NIHR to try and get an idea of the burden of the problem in the acute hospital because it's got huge implications for our staffing levels and how we provide care for patients. And what we found that when we looked in our very elderly population, so over 75, over a third of our admissions had this acute confusion as a, a, a feature of their admission at some point during their stay. And over one-fifth of our patients had a known diagnosis of dementia before coming into to hospital. And in fact, if you do a cognitive test on people, a very simple cognitive test, you'll find that actually over half of this population score low on thinking and memory tests. So this has got big implications. So we're talking to patients on a daily basis about their care, asking them to consent for various complex treatments, trying to decide about discharge planning with them. And probably for a lot of our patients, that's pretty challenging 
going to be very difficult for them to take in and process this complex information. And I think sometimes we don't actually appreciate that enough. And this is just to show you the tremendous impact of age on the risk of, of having a delirium and acute confusion. So it's really quite rare in our younger patients. It does happen, and I've seen it, um, not infrequently in younger patients, but they usually have an underlying brain disorder or may have a history of alcohol excess. But if we look in our older patients, so over 75, the rates are really very high, and they're 10 times higher in the older age groups than they are in the younger age groups. So it's got a terrific impact on the way we should be looking after our older patients. And this is also from the same work um, done by two of my registrar um, researchers. And this is to show really what the factors are that are associated with these acute confusional states in our older inpatients. And you can see <clears throat> at the top there that these patients are really very dependent. So this has got a big implication for staffing numbers, for instance. Um, for in they have a lot of incontinence, patients are often bedbound, and they are at great risk of falls. And falls is a big cause of distress, obviously, to patients and families. And we know that our, our patients with delirium are much more at risk of falling, and some of them do sustain severe injury. In terms of the associated diagnosis, there's a very strong link with infection. The reasons for that are not well understood at the moment. But the link is strong enough for some of my patients' uh, relatives to say to me, well, I think uh, my mother's got a urinary infection because she's more confused. And it's that reproducible in certain patients that the, the carers will recognise the signs straight away. And the implications for the patients and families and for the care system as a whole are shown at the bottom there. So patients with delirium are much more likely to die during the inpatient episode. They're much more likely to stay in hospital a long time. And they're much more likely to need a lot of care on discharge. And you'll all be aware of the media reports at the moment of the delays in discharge from the Oxford Hospital, supposed to be uh, some of the worst in the country. I suspect that may be an artefact of the figures that were the worst, but there's no doubt that there are big implications for social as well as health care. What about the impact of this acute confusional state going forwards for patients? Um, does it have an impact in the longer term, or is it something that if people can get over that acute episode, do they recover? And this is some work from Sharon Inouye's group in Harvard. She's probably the researcher in the world who's had the longest interest in delirium. And she has a cohort of people that she's been working with who have Alzheimer's disease. And her research would seem to suggest that in patients who have a delirium during the course of follow-up, that this actually alters the course of their trajectory. So people who have delirium seem to decline much more quickly than people who don't have a delirium, and it seems to effectively make them worse. We don't understand why that should be, but I think this is a very interesting finding and something that deserves further investigation. So just to summarise, I think... I've tried to show you that acute illness, and that includes stroke, can have an impact on thinking and memory both in the short term and the longer term, and that the, the conditions of dementia and delirium are quite tightly interrelated. So people with dementia are more likely to have a delirium, and people who have a delirium are more likely to have further cognitive decline and dementia going forwards. And there's a number of physical factors that are all interplaying to produce these clinical syndromes, of which the underlying brain disease is one, and then the impact of acute illness, possibly inflammatory mark, uh, mediators, possibly the medications that we're giving patients, are all contributing to generate the symptoms we see. Now, what are the implications in terms of the ageing population? Now, this is some figures from The Lancet back in 2005, looking at projections going forwards to the 2051 about the numbers of people over the age group, over the age of 85 in particular, who are going to have acute vascular events, stroke, and also by analogy will have it having stroke, uh, dementia and delirium. And you can see in the far right hand there, the dark bars are the um, rates that are predicted to be occurring in 2051. And you can see that there's going to be a huge increase in the prevalence of these conditions, assuming that age-specific rates don't change going forwards. And I'll come on and just mention that briefly in a minute. 
So just to finish, I'm just going to tell you very quickly about the Oxford Vascular Study and how we're using this study with great help from our um, patients within the Oxfordshire area who have TI and stroke and primary care, a lot of collaborations with GPs and allied health professionals. And this study, we try and we offer clinical care to patients from a defined number of GP practices who have mini strokes or strokes or other vascular events. We provide all the clinical care and we follow them up to a total of 10 years after their event. And that follow-up is quite complex, so we need uh, we re uh, a reliance on the, the goodwill and the um, interaction from the patients on a very frequent basis to look at their brains over time, to look at their cognitive function over time. And we are also following up for admissions to hospital to see how the impact of acute illness plays out on their ultimate cognitive outcome. And we're doing sophisticated brain imaging and blood pressure monitoring as well, so we can look and see how physiological markers interplay with the acute illness, with education, etc., to produce the cognitive outcomes in these patients. And some of the preliminary results on this uh, study have been able to show that, in fact, there's actually a falling death rate from stroke, which is clearly good news. And in fact, it looks like this, the age-specific incidence of stroke, you can see on the right there, looks like it's falling as well. So in other words, the rates that we previously saw in the 75 to 85-year age group are falling, and they look more like the 65 to 75-year age group. So in other words, the, the incidence of stroke seems to be being shifted to the right in terms of ages. And this is really good news if it proves to be borne out on subsequent years going forwards, because it means that the age predictions in terms of the burden of stroke that we thought we would get in 2051 are actually not going to be quite as, as grim as we thought. And this is just a, a, um, a modelling to show the impact, if we can reduce the impact of stroke, how much <coughs> reduction in stroke events we're likely to see going forward. So if we can delay the average onset of a stroke by five years, we'll be able to reduce the numbers of stroke by around a third going forward to 2050. So obviously we can make a huge impact if we can just delay the onset of disease by a, a, a relatively small number of years. And I think it's very interesting, Claire Sexton's work about uh, exercise, and there has been some evidence starting to come out now that exercise does have a very um, uh, potent effect at reducing um, blood pressure and reducing your risk of vascular events and probably of dementia as well. So just to finish, so these are some of the research questions that we hope we'll be able to, to answer going forward. So, so can we confirm that age-specific rates of stroke are indeed declining? And does this also apply to dementia in patients with TI and stroke? And if so, why is this happening? I think this is a really important question. You know, why are the rates becoming less? Is it because we're treating vascular risk factors better? Is it because we're generally having healthier lifestyles? Is it because people are better educated? There's quite a lot of evidence of protective effect of education. But at the moment, we just don't know. And what about predicting who's at risk of dementia, particularly after a stroke? If we know who's at high risk, we might be able to intervene in that high-risk group and produce a good outcome for them. And it's similarly, who's at risk of delirium? So one of the problems I'm faced with every day on the wards is that we might see a patient in the morning and then they become very confused at night and it causes a lot of problems. It would be really helpful if we could predict in advance who is at greater risk and intervene. And finally, can we intervene to reduce the impact of delirium? Are there things we can do to stop it happening or mitigate it? And if we can do this, is this going to produce a better outcome for our patients? Because as you're probably aware, at the moment we have very, very few treatments that are disease-modifying for dementia. And if we can find other ways to perhaps mitigate the secondary in, uh, impact of acute illness and stroke on patients who are vulnerable, that might actually be a tractable solution to the problem. I'll just finish there. Thank you.